while you're turning there, I want to say, would y'all just turn around real quick and look back there in the back and wave at Brother Willis. Amen. My man back there on the words. These people are back there working every week, making sure that things run smooth, fixing problems. Would y'all clap your hands for the volunteers that are back there every week, the young men that are working the cameras. We, we really appreciate you all for the sacrifice. They're here early every week. They don't complain. None of them are getting paid. We just do it because we want to present excellence unto the Lord. Is that all right? Amen. And one more time for the musicians that are over here. Amen. And put up with us. Amen. They've been banging since the day we opened. They've been here every Sunday. Amen. Providing great worship and music for us. Amen. So we thank God. Thank God for all of the uh, the chaplains that are here. Chaplain Melanie, it's so good to see you and your daughter. Amen. Chaplain Isaac Boke. Amen. Chaplain Ibanga, we thank God for you. Chaplain Glad to each and every person here that Jesus Christ gave his life for. Y'all ready? Oh, and y'all ain't gonna get me in trouble. I thank God for my wife. She's out of town this week. Somebody clap that I remember. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Amen. She's up in Chicago singing, so we praise God for her as well. All right, let's go. All right, Genesis 12, chapter the first verse. And the Bible says, uh, let me go ahead and read from ESV like y'all. All right, so now the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Notice he doesn't tell him exactly where he's going. If you want to stand, if you want to sit, that's fine, because we got a ways to go, all right? So if you got on heels, you might not make it, all right? So, all right, he says, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And he, watch what he says. He says, I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. And I will bless you, those who bless you, and him who dishonors you will I curse. And watch this, this is the key verse, and in you, all the families of the earth. How many families? Oh. All the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham, as God told him to do, he went as the Lord told him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was how old? 75. 75. Hope don't find it's work for me. He was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. That was the land that he was in. All right, skip on over to the next verse. I want you to see this real quick. Um, go to the next one. And it says there in verse 10, now there was a famine in the land. So Abram leaves the land where God told him to go. And because there was famine, he panics. And he went down where? He went to Egypt to sojourn or to stay there, for the famine was very severe in the land. Can't miss that. Let's go forward now to verse, uh, chapter 16. And now it says, now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She was barren. And in those times, to not be able to produce children was an incredibly horrible thing. All right? You, look, you were looked down upon in society. And she had a female Egyptian, notice we just talked about Egypt, she had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. Somebody say Hagar. Hagar. And Sarah said to Abraham, behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go in now, make love to my servant, we got kids, it may be that I shall obtain children by her, want her to be a surrogate for me. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarah. You know this is not going to happen in 2020. So after Abram lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, remember how old was Abram before? 75. So 10 years later, he is how old? 85. Hope don't find it's work for me. All right, here we go. So he lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, and Sarah, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, her Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abraham, her husband, as a wife. And he went in. He makes love to Hagar, and she, just like that, she conceives. Sarah, for 10 years... Has no children, but Hagar gets pregnant like that. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt. She started looking down on her mistress, because I can have kids and you can't. So Sarah said to Abraham, may the wrong done to me be on you. It's your fault. I gave my servant to your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between me and you. If your wife is one of the people that blame you, just look straight ahead and don't look at her, don't tap her, none of that. But Abram said to Sarah, behold, your servant is in your power. That's your servant. You do with her as you please. Then Sarah dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. And the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, hey, God, the servant of Sarah, where have you come from and where are you going? And she said, I am fleeing from my mistress, Sarah. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, return to your mistress and submit to her. 
And the angel of the Lord said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has listened, King James would say, heard your affliction. And may the Lord add a bump. Let's skip on down. Let's go. He shall be a wild donkey of a man. His hand shall be against everyone and everyone hand against him. And he shall dwell in over and against all his kinsmen. Last verse. And he says, and she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God of seeing. For she says, truly here I have seen him who looks after me. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. You can have your seat. Today I want to talk to you for just a few short moments about the incarnational love of God. The incarnational love of God. Like many of you, I watched in horror this week as dozens of insurrectionists, some of them armed, stormed into the United States Capitol building in an attempt to stop the certification of the Electoral College votes for President of the United States. I saw people scale the walls of the Capitol physically assault and trample over armed law enforcement officers and illegally storm into the building that represents the very heart of our federal government. Weapons were pointed at elected officials. A noose was hung outside of our Capitol and people posed in the office of the Speaker of the House of Representatives and walked maskless through the halls of Congress carrying a Confederate flag. Five people lost their lives in this reckless and illegal pursuit. These people, for various reasons, acted under the belief that our most recent presidential election, the results of them were corrupt and felt that their voices could not be heard. And the actions, not only did I watch them, but the actions of this group of people all week long have constantly been compared to the Black Lives Matter protests, which took place all summer long, where literally millions of people took to the streets of not only the United States, but I researched it, over 60 countries across the world. This movement was rooted in a desire to see the end of police brutality and seek justice for the lives of people like Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd. The individuals who support this movement observed that the events which took place at the Capitol, we observed them with shock and disappointment earnestly contending that if this had been a Black Lives Matter protest, it would have been met with much more harsh and brutal response than what we saw at our nation's capital. All week long, I felt the tension and divisiveness that existed in our nation. And I'm not sure if our nation has experienced this level of dissension and discord since the era of the Civil Rights Movement. And I recognize that there are confessing Christians on both sides of these matters. There are many people who think that you ought not get up in the pulpit and talk about these things, Chaplain Benton. But our pulpit and the church and the gospel of Jesus Christ is not merely theological and concerned with the study of God. The gospel is also sociological, which means that it is concerned with the development and the functioning of human society. So my objective as the gospel preacher today is to discern how the word of God speaks to the people of God regarding the will of God as it pertains to these situations and then communicate that to the people. Is that all right? Amen. So this week I prayed because I felt that burden. And I prayed and I said, God, I need a word for me because it was troubling me in my spirit. My soldiers were looking for answers. And so I said, God, where is your plan in the midst of this? So this week I prayed and God took me in my devotion to the story of Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar. So I told you the last time I preached that everything begins with purpose. So my first point is that Abraham, God gives Abraham a promise. Grace, would you say promise? promise. Say it real loud, say promise. promise. When Abraham is 75, y'all said it, y'all read it, he was 75 years old, God comes to him and he commands him to take his entire family and leave his homeland, only he doesn't tell him where he's going. There are times when God will require of us to trust him and move in faith even when he doesn't give us all the details. Has that anybody ever experienced that before? It's like in the military where you get an out order and it says, hey, I need you to do this A, B, and C, and I'll give you D, E, and F once you get there. But right now, I just need you to move. Because the Bible tells us that faith is the evidence of things that are not seen and then hallelujah. So it's faith is the evidence of things that are not 
blessing. So in Abraham's well, what we read to you is what is occurred or called the Abrahamic covenant. Somebody say Abrahamic covenant. It is the Abrahamic covenant. And notice what he said to him. He says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. Notice that all of the emphasis is on God, not on Abraham. He says, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt. This is what we call an unconditional covenant. Meaning, Abraham, you ain't got nothing to do with this. This is not dependent upon how you act, but I have determined in my sovereign purpose that I'm going to be good to you. So how many people know Abraham probably had it going on right at that, about that time, did he? So but there, that, that's point number one is a promise, but every time God gives us a promise, there is a purpose attached to the promise. Somebody say purpose. And I told you last time, I preached, that Miles Monroe contends that when a purpose of a thing is not known, abuse is inevitable. If God blesses you, when he gives you money, when he gives you a stimulus, when he gives you a job, gives you a husband, gives you a house, whenever God's blessings flow in your life, it's not to make you look good. It is so that you might accomplish his purpose, not your own. Somebody say amen. We are not created and designed so that we might receive the glory, but God is good to us so that we might reflect his glory to everybody else. So the purpose in God blessing Abraham, watch what he says. He says, and in you, all the people of the earth shall be blessed. So God's purpose was to take Abraham and set him up and say, you are going to be my representative in the earth. And when people see how good I am to you and how you worship me, they'll want to worship me just like you do. So that was the purpose in God blessing Abraham. The Bible says, let your light so shine before other people so that they may see your good works, but glorify God that is in heaven. Even the spiritual gifts of speaking in tongues and prophecy. The Bible says that a manifestation of the spirit is given to every person for the common good. Anytime God blesses you, anytime he gives you a gift, it is not for you. It is not so that you might be exalted. It is so that God might be exalted and his kingdom might be advanced in the earth. Come on, somebody say amen. He's not blessing us just for us. And in Genesis 15, go to the next slide, God promises Abraham that his covenant promise to him will be fulfilled through the birth of a son. He tells him, watch what he promises. He says, one who comes from your own body will be your heir. It's going to be your seed, not a surrogate, but your seed. So he took him outside and he says, look, look at all the stars in heaven. And if you can number the stars, that's how many children are going to come from your lineage. My God, that is powerful. But not only does God give him the promise, and then he gives him the purpose for the promise, but whenever God has purpose on your life, go to the next one, you're going to experience some level of pain. Woo! What do we do when God's purposes for our life don't just take us up on the mountaintop, but sometimes, Rodney, we might just have to go through the valley. So the Bible says that 10 years went by and Abraham, the promises of God, went unfulfilled. We went back in chapter 12, you promised this to me. You confirmed it in chapter 15. Here I am, God. 10 years later, I've been in the boom, boom room for 10 years and I ain't seen no baby. What do you do when God promises you something and he's silent for 10 years and you just have to keep on believing what he says? The pain of the promise. What do you do when it's the promise of God that causes you pain? When it's the promise of God that causes you discomfort and anxiety and embarrassment. Y'all don't believe me? Come here, Noah, and testify. He says, Noah, I want you to build an ark and let everybody watch you build an ark and tell them that it's going to flood and destroy the whole earth, but we ain't seen no rain yet. Rain had not even existed at that time, but it's the promise and the purpose of God that God said, Noah, doesn't matter what everybody else may say. I know they're going to make fun of you, but build an ark and keep telling them it's going to rain. What do you do when you are Job? And the Bible says that you are perfect and upright and righteous man, but it's the purpose of God over your life that causes you to lose everything that you have, causes your wife to go crazy, causes sores to be all over your body. What do you do when the purpose and the promise of God exists and pain comes along in the process? So it was the Hebrew boys, Daniel and the lions in. It was the purpose of God that did not exalt them, but he was glorified through their suffering. 
And so the Bible says that it was the custom of that time period for a servant to act as a surrogate when the wife of the household could not have children. So Abra, or excuse me, Sarah forces her Egyptian slave to sleep with her husband and Hagar gets pregnant. Imagine that you are now Hagar. You didn't ask to be in this situation. You didn't ask for Abraham, but this burden is now placed upon you. And Hagar was purchased when Abraham and, and Sarah went down into Egypt and disobeyed God during the famine. She didn't seek Abraham and Sarah out. She didn't ask for these promises. She's a woman of color. We know that because she's from Egypt. She's a woman of color away from her family, away from her land and her people. She's living in subjugation. And Sarah uses her own body to fulfill her own selfish desires because she's tired of waiting on God. Imagine what it's like to be Hagar. Here I am in this situation. But pain will always be the end result when we try to accomplish God's will, our will, excuse me, our will, our way, and in our time. I'm tired of waiting on a husband, God, so I'm going to go out and sleep with him and try and get him to commit to me. I'm tired of waiting on you to get a house, tired of waiting on you to get a promotion, tired of being at JBLM, so I'm going to call Brent. I'm not going to wait on you. I'm going to go try to make my will go through my own way. Because I'm tired of waiting on you. You promised this to me, but it's been 10 years, so I'm tired of this, so I'm going to go about and do it my own way. And whenever we do that, we will experience pain. Because God does not need our help, and he does not need to use loopholes in order to accomplish his will. If he said, Abraham, that you're going to have a baby, you ain't got to go do it in your own way. All we got to do is trust the Lord, even though it's been 10 years. Somebody say amen. So let me say this in your hearing. Sometimes if your situation doesn't change, God's not trying to change your situation. He's trying to change us. So maybe if things in the marriage aren't changing, maybe if things in the unit aren't changing, maybe the reason that we can't get along with our supervisor or get along with this person or that person, God said, I didn't come to change the situation. That's easy. There's some things in you that I need to develop, that need to be matured, that need to be grown. And so I'm going to work on you and you're going to stay in the situation until you change. And when you change, then maybe I'll change the situation. Somebody say amen. Pain always serves a purpose. Success in God is not found on the mountaintops, it's found in the valley. Mountaintops are for inspiration, but it is the valley that is for transformation. And God, listen to what I'm saying, God will never waste your pain. He will never waste your pain. If you are experiencing pain in any area, there is a reason and a purpose attached to it. And if you're in the valley experiencing pain, there is a purpose. Watch what I'm about to tell you. Fruit does not grow on the mountaintop. It grows in the valley. Amen. Growth does not happen up here. It happens down there. So there is the promise. There is the purpose. And then there is the pain. And then after that comes the party. The tension between Sarah and Hagar becomes so bad that the Bible says Sarah dealt harshly with her so bad that she ran away from her. Here it is now. Hagar is the victim. Somebody say she's the victim. She's been abused, mistreated, ostracized. She's the victim of injustice. Somebody say amen. And now she is homeless. And let's not forget, in the midst of all of this, she's pregnant with another woman's husband. By another woman's husband. The source and the source of her injustice is a Christian. The source of her injustice is not some pagan person. It is the person that God said that he was going to bless. That he was going to use to bless the entire world. How are you going to bless the entire world, Abraham, when the people in your own house ain't being treated right? You want God, we want God to make us a wonder. We want God to do great and mighty things and take us before exalted nations. But we don't even know how to love our husband or our wife correctly. God said there's purpose. And so there's the party. Because how is the world going to be blessed through Abraham when there is division in his own home? How is God going to bless America when there is division going all over our land? And the next point after the party is his presence. And this is where it gets good. Because in the worst moment of her life, in the moment where she needed God the most, the Bible says that the angel of the Lord found her on the way to Shur. And the angel of the Lord. 
Lord, many theologians believe that the angel of the Lord is a term that is used to describe when the Lord Jesus himself appears in the Old Testament. When he condescends down to the earth in order to make himself manifest to man, the Bible says when God wants to show up, you will see it in the Bible written as the angel of the Lord. So sure, where she's headed, sure is on the way back to her homeland in Egypt. So Hagar has given up. She said, I don't want nothing more to do with this. I'm done. And here she is. Have you ever been in a place where you've given up? When things in your marriage ain't going well, when things in your house, things in your job ain't going well, and it seems like all hell is breaking loose, but in the midst of your situation, the angel of the Lord shows up in the middle of your situation. Has God ever shown up when you needed him right in the moment where you needed him the most? The Bible says that the angel of the Lord, watch this, it found her. She didn't find the angel because she wasn't looking for God. She had already given up. Is there anybody in here that can testify that there was a time in my life when I wasn't looking for God, when I had given up on God, when I wasn't thinking about the church, when I wasn't thinking about living saved, but God sent somebody and he found me even though I wasn't looking for him. Man, y'all, I'm a man, y'all, I'm preaching better than you saying amen. There are times in my life when you know you weren't thinking about God, but he sent you a chaplain. He sent you a preacher. He sent Jesus. Yes. And the Bible 
and he preached his gospel to other brown-skinned Aramaic-speaking Jews who were oppressed by the Roman Empire. And the Bible says that God heard her. She named her child Ishmael, which means God hears me. So every time, Mitchell, she looked at her children, she looked at her son, she remembered that in the midst of the worst situation in my life, when I prayed and I cried and nobody else understood me, when the man that you said that you was going to bless, nobody understood me, God, you heard me. Anybody know what it's like when you've cried tear after tear? Sorrow after sorrow, sleepless night after sleepless night, and God finally sends you a word that says that I hear you. There's nothing like when somebody, when God hears your cry. And the angel of the Lord said to her, you have conceived and will have a son, and you will name his Ishmael because the Lord has heard your cry of affliction. The first person in the Bible that the God Jesus manifested his presence to was a young Egyptian woman of color who had just suffered injustice and been oppressed and abused and left pregnant and homeless by a Christian couple. So if God loved her enough to show up for her, he'll show up for you. Notice now, he hadn't answered Abraham prayer in 10 years, but the moment Hagar left the house, she's not even covenant. She's not even a part of Abraham's blessing. So if God showed up for a woman who was not even a part of the covenant, if he showed up for a woman who was not even an Israelite, she was not even a Jew, but God heard her prayer. If he heard her, he'll hear you. If he heard her, he'll hear the homosexual. He'll hear the lesbian. He'll hear the abused person. He'll hear the molested person. No matter what you are going through, God will hear your prayer. If he showed up for Hagar, you can't tell me he won't show up for chapter. You can't tell me he won't show up for Rodney. You can't tell me he won't show up for Mitchell. All we got to do is call him. Yes. And not only did God hear her, but the next part says that God sees her. Jesus. Lord, you're blessing us on today. The Bible said that Hagar knew that God sees her. And he's not just talking about that he could see her with her eyes, but he could see through her. He could understand her, that he knows her in an intimate, loving way. And he revealed himself to her so that he, that she could see him. He manifested himself to nobody in the Bible before he manifested himself to Hagar. That's the first person in the world that he shows up on the scene for. And he tells her, I see you. And I want you to see me. This week I begin to ask God, I need to see your glory. I need to see your hand in the midst of this. Because I know that you see what we're going through. I know that you hear the cry of our nation. I saw the chaplain on their brain. I know that you see what's going on in our world. And I know, God, now we need to see you. Is there anybody that can say, God, we need to see you. We need to see you. My last point. And we're going to go home and stop boring y'all. It's peace. The Bible says that the angel of the Lord, watch this now, this is, this is worth the price of the mission, even though it was free. He says, the angel of the Lord told her, go back. <laughs> y'all look at me, wait a minute, go back to the same person that was just mistreating me? Yes. He says, go back because now that I have heard you and now that you have seen me, I'm going to give you peace that is down on the inside so it doesn't matter. What Sarah does. Doesn't matter anymore what Abraham does. Is there anybody that goes, when God changes me, when he changes us on the inside, I can go back and I can work under any condition. Treat me how you want to treat me, supervisor. I got the peace of God because I know that if I cry out, I know he'll hear me. You better watch how you talk to me because if I hit my knees and I go to prayer, he's always. Show me how annoying. 
anointed you are with your husband and a wife, they acting right, and you still love on them. Show me how anointed you are when things ain't going your way. But he gives her peace on the inside. He says, go back. Because my perfect will is not for there to be separation between Ishmael, who is not the promised child, and Isaac. My perfect will is that there be unity. My perfect will is not that there would be red states and blue states and Democrats and Republicans and black and white. My will is that there would be unity in the nation, but it will only happen if my people know that I have heard them, I see them, and in the midst of what you're going through in this nation, God said, I will give you peace.
felt oppressed. I felt the hand of injustice. I know what it's like to grow up without a father. I, I feel what you were saying. And I want to have a relationship with you. The Bible says that if we would confess with our mouth that the Lord Jesus Christ died on a cross and was resurrected on the third day, that we would be saved. Would you pray this prayer with me? God, I believe that you are the Son of God, that you love me enough to leave your throne in heaven and come and die on a cross for the sins that I commit. Today, God, I give you my life, that you might transform me from the inside out, that despite everything that is going on around me, that because I have you, you will give me internal peace. Peace about what is going on in my life. Peace about what is going on in the nation. But most of all, that I have peace with you about my eternal destiny. Have your way in my life. Be glorified through my life and my actions. And may my life bring you glory. God, today I want to pray for this nation, these people who have felt the divisiveness that has been going on in our land. And God, we know that you're sovereign. And sometimes we just want to understand what do you want us to do in the midst of this. But God, I pray right now that you would give us peace. I pray right now that you would give us an external peace that things would, would, would kind of simmer down in our nation, that truth and justice would prevail. But most of all, God, that no matter what happens, that we have an internal peace that knows that you are sovereign. And no matter what happens in this world, God, that you are yet in control. God, for these things, we thank you. We know that we can always find peace and comfort in the midst of your word. And so we thank you that when we can't turn to anybody else, we can always turn to you and know that you will always answer.